When Gensler speaks, people listen. A lot of people listen because they're the largest architecture and design firm in the world. And it has a lot to say about human connection in life and in the workplace. While you learn so much from all of these sessions of Be Original Americas, we are now, as Gensler sees it, in the season of hope. And in this hope, we know that the virtual world will always be part of our lives. But we also know that we want to be together in social environments. Today, again, as I said, we'll learn so much more from our Gensler presenters, Erin Gag, Principal and Design Leader, Gensler Baltimore, and Linda Pileggi, Design Director, Associate of Gensler Philadelphia. And now I take great pride in presenting Erin and Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. All right. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm sure I saw uh, or some of you were on my talk last year during COVID, and here we are again during COVID, um, kind of. It's ending now, at least, hopefully. Um, and, and I brought Linda on because we've got some really interesting um, kind of uh, call it news about what we're thinking about and how we're reacting to, um, to people going back to work. So the hybrid work and the human uh, value of human connection in the workplace is something that's really on the minds of everybody right now as, as we really kind of think about this return to office um, scenario we're on to right now. Um, I am, oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. There we go. Started off well. I'm Aaron Gag. I'm. Uh, I just had my 25th anniversary with Gensler. Um, I've been. Um, I've been involved in workplace uh, for almost my entire section of Gensler, and a little bit of product design work in there as well, which is how I learned uh, learned about Beth and, and met her many many years ago when I was much uh, younger and cuter. But uh, anyway, I really wanted to introduce Linda here. Go ahead, Linda. Great. My name is Linda Pileggi, and I am a design director in the Philadelphia office. I actually started my Gensler career in the San Francisco office, where I spent some time um, in Silicon Valley working with tech clients. Um, but I did come back to the Philadelphia area, and I have been with Gensler for about 10 years total now. Um, my expertise as Aaron's is, is uh, focused on workplace design. And I have had the pleasure of working with Aaron for what, seven years now, I think. So we work <laughs> on projects all of the time and we, we pretty much, you know, speak on a daily basis, which is really great yeah. um, because right, everything is about relationships. So not just the work environment or school environment, um, but uh, you know, you expect to connect with people and that's what we get the pleasure of doing every day, so. Too many times. All right. <laughs> One thing about Gensler is, is that they, we are a research-based and research-driven organization. Uh, we started doing surveys uh, you know, way back in 2006 or 2005, maybe even for the first one that was actually done in London. Um, and you know, we, we, we update that all the time and we, we constantly have a, a benchmark of information that's constantly being updated. Um, and we've actually changed that to now not just the workplace survey, but actually we call it the, the workplace experience index now too. So it really is not about just how your offices function, but how they feel and how they, um, how they make you feel. Um, during COVID, we've been asked all kinds of questions and these are all sort of long-winded, but a lot of it is really about what are the tools? How are we going to be able to work remotely? How are we going to be able to work as we come back with some people still being remote and some people being actually in the office? How does that actually affect our culture of our organization, of our offices? Um, and then how do we do a more inclusive job of being able to um, bring people back in, you know, not even on the idea of, of who's here and who isn't, but what's the inclusivity uh, bonus we can actually make as part of this um, as, as, as this pandemic ends. Uh, and what are the rules and policies that we're actually going to be working on as far as how people do actually return to the office? Um, so during during COVID, we actually actually prior just prior to COVID, we did another iteration of the workplace survey. During COVID, we did two more. We did one early on in probably about April, and then another one in uh, October. And those gave us all kinds of new information. So this is, this is actually pretty, um, pretty up-to-date stuff you're all seeing here. 
Uh, so on the top of this, really to take a look at what is what are the things we've gained? Uh, we, we looked at the idea that we can plan uh, around home needs. We can really help caregiving of our, of our children or our elderly parents. Uh, commuting, less time in the commute. I've got more time uh, to either work during the day, which is what most of us are, seem to be doing, uh, versus just being able to enjoy our families and our houses you know, during that time. Uh, you know, collaboration, we've got new tools that under, so we can understand um, you know, differently how to communicate with each other. And Linda and I have been actually doing this quite a lot that you know, I think normally you know, prior to COVID, you know, we'd probably talk once every couple of weeks, and it would be a you know kind of a I just call her up and do something. But now we're we're basically able to be on about three or four different platforms at once, not including just actual you know kind of you know text through our mobile phones, but you know the ability for us to actually meet and talk and, and share ideas has actually increased during this time. Um, and then we've got things we lost on the caregiving side. I need time away from my family sometimes, right? That's, that's a big deal. Now, Linda has a couple of smaller kids. I've got one that's just about to go off to college. Uh, if anybody's on from Virginia Tech, that's where he's going. Not in design, though. Um, and we are, you know, we're, we're every now and then you need, you need a little time to just, you know, kind of, you know, relax and, and understand how to, you um, uh, how to you know, recenter yourself, and that was in that was my me time was in my commuting. That twenty minutes or so I'd have driving from my house to my office was when I'd listen to books, and I'd, I'd be actually be able to you know, just just you know, you know pay attention to nothing but the road in front of me. Um, but at the same time, collaboration really has suffered, and mentorship has suffered in the fact that I can't just walk around and and um and you know see what people have on their desks and be able to ask that immediate question i now have to schedule it which means then somebody has to then they don't have to but they generally do they they'll they'll work up a presentation i don't want that i want something that's very raw and in the in the in the moment so it's 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 that has changed a bit and how i can mentor people how linda mentor people is very different than it was pre-pandemic so that's something we're working on but you can kind of see some of these other things all going all the way to the end, social and culture. Um, the fact that I can have deeper connections with my immediate team on this kind of thing, just like I described, um, you know, Linda and I, our relationship, uh, being able to have all these uh, great platforms that we can kind of share and, and speak on. Um, but then I feel very disconnected, as I mentioned, with the mentorship. Uh, about being able to just see what's going on and see that the kind of moment to moment connection with people. And sometimes you really have to force a con uh, you know, contact with people just to keep connected to them. Um, so people are missing human contact. And it's really one of the leading um, uh, things in this, in this talk anyway, that you know, really 74% of the people say what they miss most about the offices is, is seeing the people. I and mean, I think everybody can, um, you know, can really relate to that one very, very well. Um, but at the other side of that, 51% say we're staying up, uh, up to date with one <clears throat> on what others are working is much harder at home, only because you're not seeing that, seeing it develop moment to moment. You know, you're seeing, you know, kind of in, intermediate presentations that happen and that are kind of, you know, kind of all put together versus the raw stuff that's all between, you know, you're really not seeing the sausage being made. And as we get into the research that we've done, uh, this is this is the April findings uh, from last uh, last year said on the bottom lines here that said 44% of people are looking for some kind of hybrid model when they return to work. Um, in the the October version, that has turned up to 52% of the time. Um, and at the at the right hand side of that, we're also seeing that from 12 12 percent in last April of people saying they'd rather just be working at home full time. That's actually risen to 20 or to 19 percent. Um, and, and you can see that full time in the office has dropped from 44 to 29 percent. So that's actually a big change in how we're kind of thinking about you know how people go back to the office. And we'll get into that in all kinds of different uh, different mediums in just a minute here. We're really seeing that future is hybrid. So we've got the idea that people have their home office set up. You know, this 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 background of mine is what people have seen now for a year and, and a few months, and in, in and some element of that probably will will you know will live on for the next uh, next couple of years at least at least one or two days a week. 
Um, but the office, we're looking, I'm trying to understand that is how is this thing actually changing? What is it? It's, 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 it's more of a hub than a place that I'm going to do all my full-time heads down uh, focused work. What we see changing is the idea of organizational design where, you know, how an, how an, uh, a, an office, a company organizes itself to, you know, kind of be together and, and have that mentorship, have that connection so that you feel like you're actually part of the office and not just a, a remote task rabbit worker on something um, is something that, that is, is on top of mind of all of our clients right now. Uh, that employee experience about what am I doing when I come in? You know, because I can do, I can be much more efficient on my focus work when I'm at home. What is it that I gain by going to the office? How do I, and then number three, how do I get that culture of the office? How do I understand that I'm part of a bigger organization and not just, uh, you know, not just dealing with a couple of managers and a couple of designers, you know, this way and, and a client here and there. The fluidity of place is about really how, how, when I go into the office, when I go into the hub, what am I doing and how do I, you know, I've got a laptop, I've got this, that, and the other, and how do I kind of move between the spaces? How do I fill my time between meetings? Um, metrics that matter is something that we're really kind of, you, you know, it's working on right now of how that really is effective. And we've got, uh, we've got apps and things we've designed to help people as they go through the day understand where they are spending most of the time so we can then begin to really fine tune that office in the future. And then collaboration methods is, is, is an interesting one because we're not going to be all together at once. So how do people that are virtual really work with the people who are in place? You know, when we used to have conference calls and we have drawings on the table, uh, you know, the, the person on the other side of the phone was really at a disadvantage because you couldn't see you know, what was actually happening at the table. Now we've got better, um, um, you know, better technology to support it, as well as, you know, you know much more advanced, uh, you know, video cameras and, and conference phones. Um, so multi-channel discovery, this is, this is really what we're working on for the most, most companies right now, is really kind of focusing in on what it is up in the front half of their project. It's really the strategy phase. And that's, that's gonna be all kinds of things like, how are people working on what the policies are about how, how you're returning to the office, how people are um, really working with people who are remote. Um, and to do that, we're doing all these, these vision sessions and web surveys and activity analysis in order to understand really what that is well before we actually start drawing anything. <clears throat> so the discovery, unfortunately, my can't read the stop of my slides anymore. But uh, really, what we're looking at is this idea that the workplace is really these four bubbles on the right. It is the physical space, like it always has been. But now it, you're, you're really building in the technology and tools to really help that uh, the communication uh, uh, you know, be much more fluid between the people who are, are in the office and the people who are not. Um, culture and behaviors, this is... This is like an ongoing thing that we're really kind of developing with our clients, but how you how people actually behave in the space. What is the idea of you know being able to be you know, you know where, where are hand washing stations? Where are you kind of you know, you doing different things in different uh, areas of the office? And how are you actually kind of you know building your building your portfolio of spaces to actually support uh, a healthy workplace in the future? And then policy and operations is really about how how the um, management or the facilities team really can help the process actually work and, and move forward and, and have, a, have an um, organized workplace down the line. So really what we're saying though is work and workplace are going to be forever altered. And I love this graphic here where we start with the entire work, uh, work from home and then we just push off to the side because we don't 100% know where it's going. We know it's not going to be the same. Uh, so really looking at this uh, new era of choice and autonomy about how, you know, how you actually engage with an office. You know, not every office is going to go back and, and say, well, now that now that it's over, you, you've got to come back in. And this is your desk forever. But but the ability for you to have that laptop and, and go between spaces or stay home or or something in between there. We've got several people actually that are going to work at the beach for all summer long. 
So, I mean, that, that, that's going to really kind of hopefully up their, um, um, <laughs> their wellness quotient. <laughs> Wish I could be one of those people. But really, the idea is, is that, you know, don't waste a good, uh, don't waste a good crisis. You know, how do you go through something like this and really kind of, you know, dig down and learn how to, how to change and how to be a different, uh, different person on the back end of it. And I'm going to transfer over to Linda. Great. I had to mute myself. My dog was barking. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to take a pause here and just say if anyone has a question, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box and we can pause. We don't have to just plow through all the questions or, or all the slides. Um, we can take a moment and kind of um, answer any questions that you may have that's relevant to the slides that we're on. Uh, so the question that's at the forefront of everyone's mind is really about what might the future look like? We know that people want to go back to the office, but the expectation is that it will not look the same. So Erin, can you advance, please? OK, so it all starts at home. How has the past year really shaped us and impacted how we view space? The future workplace will reflect not only where we are today, but also into the future. Again, we expect it to be different when we go back. We know that we have lost something by being at home for so long, but we've also gained something. But what is that thing that's gonna drive us back? And we really think it's about choice and autonomy around our day, bringing our full selves to the office, um, but also having balance. I think balance is really at the, at the heart of this. Um, and this, you know, reimagining the workplace isn't just a knee jerk reaction to, to a pandemic, but it's really about seizing the day to reimagine how we might experience space and redefine our expectations when we go back. So the idea of home is office and office is home. You know, the lines are blurring between the two and there's really great things about being at home, whether it's the ability to move around and change with the light of the day, to be able to grab a snack, to have coffee, maybe pop out outside for a few moments, take a walk, walk the dog, get the kids from the bus. There's all those things. So how can we kind of boil that down and kind of take away what are the best things that we've we've kind of gained out of this experience and not lose those things? So in a hybrid environment, technology is really gonna be um, the thing that sort of binds that together and supports the combination of in-person and virtual at the same time with equality. And we know that that's a challenge. So the ability to just drop into the office seamlessly will allow all team members to work together at a moment's notice. Um, so this idea of a connected kitchen, um, you know, how we envision the, the, the sort of heart of the, of the house in that kitchen environment, you know, where, what are the conversations that happen there? It's the same thing with the office. We talked about relationships earlier, just as you have relationships with family and friends and through your work, you know, your education, your university environment, the same thing translates to the work environment. You know, we spend a lot of time at work, most cases more so than at home you know, with our family and friends. So um, we know that relationships happen there. And as Erin was saying, people are going back to have more of that connection, mentorship, um, social connections, and, and we form friendships there. Erin is a friend of mine. We, 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 we talk every day and it's not just about work. We find out about each other's kids and struggles and we help each other through that day. So the same thing happens around this idea of this connected kitchen as a social hub you know, offices hub um, that sort of pairs with the home, work from home environment, but we come into the office for that social interaction. So the idea of in-person and virtually to connect with your work community um, and the emphasis being on amenity spaces to help foster those relationships and allow people to recharge, but also work anywhere, not just at the desk. So we, we started talking about this idea of work points beyond um, the work desk, you know, focus work happens at a desk and in a private office, but maybe you're the type of person that really kind of thrives about picking up your laptop and going into more of an active zone. I know I am like that. Um, so other people aren't. So it's about having those choices throughout the work environment to really allow people to define when and where they want to work according to their work style. So again, open office has been 
a hot topic for many years. Obviously, you know, the more open things get, the more uh, acoustics will play a part. You know, where do we allow people to focus without distraction? And where do we infuse those areas of collaboration? So we're seeing a lot of these solutions are wrapped up in furniture, uh, less architecture, more furniture. Um, and what are those softer elements that give us comfort? Um, you know, we're seeing more biophilia in spaces and the ability to reconfigure lightweight furniture, but having the technology there to support, obviously the technology allows us to work, but having high tech and low tech kind of balance within the space. I know my pers personally, I need a break from all the technology. I need to get away from it because it's really draining for me as I'm sure a lot of other people. So where are those other spaces that maybe don't really have a lot of tech? Um, so we're seeing that flexibility is really at the core of this, uh, of the, the open work environment to be able to reconfigure and kind of you know, ad hoc, be able to manage your day and your team's day to be able to get together as needed um, and effortlessly. So obviously conferencing is gonna change in a, in a hybrid environment where you have some people outside of the office and some people in, it's really gonna be the technology piece that enables us to equally feel like we're of a level playing ground and not the haves and have nots. You know, the people in the room have a priority and the second tier is the people outside of the room. So it's really a balance and the technology is gonna to have to work harder than ever. Um, so that conferencing environment is also gonna change. We're seeing more individual small focus rooms that also could be a one-on-one -on -one virtual call um, with a colleague that may be outside of the office. Um, so technology is really gonna be at the heart of this, um, but I think our approach to conferencing is gonna change and the ability to transform spaces um, as needed. Again, whether it's a whiteboard, pinning up work, just having that visibility and seeing the work so that teams can collaborate and, and quickly get back to you know, independent work. So that's sort of toggling in between collaboration you know, based on technology to enable that in a quick way to be more productive in our day and feel energized by that movement between spaces. And then again, connection to outdoor spaces, connection to daylight and air, fresh air, the ability to, to extend your, your work environment to the outdoors. And it's not just an area of respite, but it's also a place to work if you want. You know, there's no reason if the technology's there and the furniture supports that, that you couldn't work on a terrace, a beautiful terrace that has green space, outdoors, um, you know, depending on the climate, we're really seeing a push for this um, to really take what we can learn from other climates um, and be able to extend the life of those spaces, not just um, you know, a few months of the year, but really kind of push the boundaries and how can lighting and, and you know, heating elements kind of play a role in that. So we wanted to take pause and just talk about how Aaron and I are working with a client currently. Um, Armstrong World Industries, as you know, is what they, they consider themselves an acoustic company, but they sell ceiling products and a lot of other products as well. Um, so we've been working with them for about a year now, and it really started with uh, a campus strategy. So their campus site is out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, multiple buildings. Aaron, it's, it's a, Aaron worked on that uh, originally in the 90s, so he was part of that original master plan and design of these spaces. Um, but you know, it's time to refresh and things have changed, not only um, how people work, but they're the industry that they relate to. So they're consumer goods product uh, company. So, uh, you know, how they bring in the community, the, the, the design community that comes to the campus, they're the AWI community. So there's lots of different factors that are kind of playing a role here. And we've started to work with their leadership to understand what are the things that need to occur even over you know, a long period of time, taking it piece by piece, but what is that overarching vision? Um, obviously, you know, ceiling products and acoustics are at the forefront of their mind, but we started talking about healthy spaces. And really that was sort of born out of the pandemic, but what does healthy spaces mean to them? So we've spent a lot of time working with this client to really uncover that. So again, like Aaron was saying, before we put pen to paper, there's a lot of strategy that happens a lot of conversations, brainstorming, and working with our clients to really align their business strategies with 
design strategies. So what you're seeing here on the screen, um, the, the blue at the top are AWI's uh, business strategies. So it was around innovation, governance, communication and alignment, cultural acceleration, organizational acceleration and talent acceleration. So out of that, we boiled that down to four pillars or design strategies at the heart of that. So uh, the first one centered on wellness and sustainability. Uh, the next was uh, to create a wow factor, delivering premium customer and employee experience and celebrating the brand, um, optimizing for workplace flexibility, um, you know, being able to adapt, adapt to whatever changes may come in the future, the next pandemic, or just organizational needs change over time, um, and the ability to digitalization to innovate faster. Um, and then that fostering connection to community. So at the heart of it, um, not only is it the AWI community, but the connection to their partners and their design partners, um, and then the local uh, environment. So there's a lot of connection or desire to have connection with that local environment. Um, and then at the underneath of all of that, you know, we talk about change management as really being that piece of the pie. You know, just creating space isn't enough. So we're having all of these strategy conversations, but when you hand the space over to people, they need to know the rules of the road. And that is a robust uh, change management piece of this. So I love this quote, designers prepare space for the people, but change managers prepare people for the space. I think that's fantastic. So you give them the rules of the road, you, you let people sort of anticipate what's coming. Um, and then, you know, let's test and, and, and push forward. So, Aaron, so again, we've talked about healthy spaces, and we started to say, you know, how do we envision what a healthy space is? So, the client and us, and as an industry, like what are those things? What is that recipe that goes in to really make a, a healthy space? And while a lot of the answers lied in environmental, um, we realized that a lot of them also were under a sensory kind of lens, and then also a cultural lens. So, um, you know, you need to sort of think about the space in a holistic way. And when we think about healthy spaces, it you know, we can't just put a blind eye to the cultural, experiential, and sensory pieces of it. It's it's a holistic approach. So that was something that we spent a lot of time unpacking and really crafting that together. The other piece of this um, that Erin talked about with the strategy piece is when we approach a project, every project is, is unique and different and every client is different. So what we do during that upfront strategy piece is really define the purpose behind the project. And that comes directly from our clients. That's not us. This is something that we craft together with our client and that will look different for every project. And that becomes our North Star as we design spaces. By the time we get to the that piece where we're kind of crafting that design story and really kind of shaping the space, we already have a strong foundation and we're saying, okay, all of those goals that we set out during the strategy piece, are we, are we achieving those goals? So we're always going back and making sure, is this move reinforcing what our goals that we set out? I'm gonna go to the next. Um, so something that we started to think about as um, we were looking at this campus and this large project, knowing that it was such a shift for them, it was a transformational shift that we started to think, well, what if we did a pilot project? What if we took a portion of their uh, experience center and reimagine that space as almost like a smaller version of what that larger workplace could be. And we worked with them to identify that space in the building that had two um, exterior exposures to glass and, and daylight and views. The campus is on this beautiful setting. Um, it's like farmland, open views, uh, lots of beautiful old growth trees. Um, so we found this space that really could be a showcase and let them uh, use it as a testing ground. So we started yeah. calling it the living lab um, to really kind of showcase their innovation, emerging products, test new work styles, um, test new furniture ideas. Um, and we really kind of pushed the boundaries in this space, which was really exciting. They are occupying the space now um, and they have been for about a month now and we're already learning learning from it and adjusting. So the pilot, the really, the purpose behind the pilot is to test and evolve 
and then at, and learn so that we can feed into the larger project. And, and it really just enables us for more success down the road. Sort um, of a mod model home, right? Of yep. New office. So the space is about 10,000 square feet and it has all of the parts and pieces that would go into the work environment in the future. Um, so there is a future building um, on campus that we're focused on now. It's uh, they're building 701. It's a three story building um, that has lots of amenity spaces, work zones, atrium space, community spaces. Um, but this is like a microcosm of that. So it does include this sort of work lounge, amenity zone, cafe, meeting space at the front that connects to an outdoor space um, with movable walls. Um, there's greenery. There's a digital aspect that brings um, light. Uh, what, what are the metrics of the space? How many people are occupying at this time? Um, how is it performing? But then that also that digital element allows them to, um, you know, have a, a virtual environment, all hands meeting, you could have people in the room outside of the room. So they're really kind of testing these ideas now. Um, and then you transition back into the more proper kind of work zone that includes um, desking, a variety of desking types and typologies. Um, an ideation area that we were calling the ideation pit at one time um, with, that has digital and um, some stadium seating as well as reconfigurable areas for ideating and, and whiteboarding. Um, we have a variety of flexible uh, interior spaces that include huddle rooms and touchdown spaces. And, um, you know, we're encouraging them to use furniture to reconfigure. Um, not only with the furniture, but also the demountable wall systems, um, which is really enabling them to have ultimate flexibility, yeah. again, to adapt to the future. They never know what's going to you know, be down the road. So to build in that infrastructure up in day one allows them to kind of test out how easy is it to reconfigure? Is this something that occurs over the course of a few days? Um, is it something mm -hmm. that I need you know, someone to come in and do? Or is it something I can do? So they're learning all of these elements. Um, and then we do have a variety of smaller focus rooms that do have technology and AV integrated into those. Um, and then we have this area called the tech zone um, that kind of plays off of one of their products, if you know, um, that is a, a slightly quieter space. It has great views out to the exterior, um, but is more of a working, almost like a, a maker space that has um, this integrated you know, storage and pegboard and, and their tools. Um, so they're able to really kind of look at product, um, you know, make uh, adjustments and, and kind of use that as a working, a true working space. So here is uh, that first image uh, upon entry. We did have a strong um, brand integration um, team that worked with us. And so with Gensler, obviously we have a lot of product, uh, product, product, I can't talk. Uh, Practice uh, areas. Thank you. Practice areas and uh, scope of services. So we can provide, it, you know, we're kind of a one-stop shop in that way. Um, so we work very closely with um, our digital experience teams, our brand teams, our experience. So it all comes together. And then Erin and I are part of the, you know, architecture and interiors portion. Um, but this graphic was really um, developed with our, our team and AWI that sort of, uh, you know, has a nod to the the uh, native plants in the area and um, takes cues from, you know, that biophilia and the patterning mm -hmm. and, uh, and their brand. So this is that this, front door. This black thing is a, uh, is a Gensler design piece of furniture for um, hand sanitizer and, uh, and uh, uh, mask dispenser. Just had to put a plug in there for that. I know, look at you. Um, well, it's funny, we talk about, you know, do you build in these things? Like, we don't know if hand, sanitize, hand sanitizers are going to be around, you know, for the beginning, you know, for the end of time. So do we want to build it in or do we want it to be this really cool kind of freestanding element that if over time we don't want it around, maybe, you know, there's a different approach. It's just a, a piece of furniture at that yeah. point. Um so this is that space that I was talking about, that work lounge that has a variety of seating types and that digital element, again, giving metrics of the space. Um, you know, obviously we started having this conversation with Armstrong during, um, during a pandemic four months in. So it was really hard to, for people to imagine going back. And, and for some people going back, um, 
is is experiencing this pilot for the first time. So we've talked a lot about, you know, when you walk into the space, there's there could be some anxiety about coming in into an environment like this. So what can the space tell you that just gives you like you can navigate, you understand who's here, where are those um, where are the high peaks of activity in the office and where are they happening? So maybe if you don't want to be in a really active zone, you can kind of pick and choose and, and move around the space as you see fit and that you're comfortable with. This is that ideation pit area, like I talked about. Um, there was an existing skylight, which you kind of see that illuminated ceiling panel. Um, but again, we are, uh, you know, they're a consumer product um, company. So we're really kind of pushing the boundaries of using their product thoughtfully and strategically to reinforce that story. Um, you know, back to those goals, every, every pillar or goal that we've set, we said, well, can an Armstrong product solve for that? Or, or at least help to solve for that. So we're trying to push those boundaries with their product offerings and, and even push them from a product development standpoint. Um, here is that open office environment. Um, again, lots of AWI products, um, but they are kind of testing various work types and uh, work settings. Uh, what you're seeing off to the left is what we're calling a pinwheel. Um, so it's just, um, a variety of shifts in, in direction of um, these workstation types so that it, it just gives a little bit of separation and your, your view is not face to face, it's kind of to the side. So this is something that we're testing now and they're providing feedback on. This is that area that I, I mentioned that's called the tech zone. So again, it's a little bit further into the space. Uh, it's a little bit quieter because it is, you know, away from that sort of front of house space that that work zone that we talked or uh, work lounge that we talked about. Um, and we need to be sensitive to people focusing and not distracting at the desk per se in that open environment. Um, that is something that sort of came to light out of our research um, at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, every year we have our design forecast that comes out and talks about. Um, you know, how is the work environment performing? And one of the things that we found was that distraction was a big, was a big concern. So with this environment, um, we have these movable panels that have acoustic properties. So they're able to kind of close off this space as needed. Um, we do have a really cool video of this, but we're not sharing it on the screen today, um, but it kind of shows you how those screens pivot. Um, so back up front, and the in that first impression kind of high impact zone this is that cafe kind of workspace that connects to their outdoor space so we did introduce some biophilia and and part of this is them just understanding um how to manage that you know we're bringing in live plants and obviously it's like yeah genzer that's great that you bring these ideas but how are we going to manage this you know you don't want a bunch of dead plants hanging you know <laughs> above us so um they're learning how to manage that and and what that looks like so um every step of the way this pilot is really allowing them and us to learn and kind of adapt so that when we move forward into a larger project we can kind of understand, okay, what are the things that we have to have? What are the things that people loved? What are the things that just perform so well and contributed to healthy spaces that we have to make sure that we get right and, and incorporate? And this pilot just allows us to go forward with confidence and um, to really be able to work with our client to have a successful project. Thanks, Linda. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things we wanna get into now is really, you know, what are the other things that can help people want to come back to the office? What are these enablers that, that can help out your, your kind of human connection, your, your, your mentorship connection, your, and your cultural connection? Um, I should really look at, at amenities as being a really big part of that. Um, and, and, it's, it, and it's been growing over the years is what I'm gonna describe as the idea that they aren't about escaping work, they're about optimizing it. How do you make sure that they, you have the right amenities in the, in the office, in, the, in your uh, organization uh, that people are actually interested in and really want to do and want to, um, want to be part of? Um, you know, they, the amenities can support and recruit uh, and, and help retain your valuable talent. I mean, one of the, one of the biggest things we get into with our clients is, you know, the, the talent acquisition right now is, is a big issue for them. 
people uh, people leaving to go to the companies for just money is not a not a great um, not a great thing for them. They 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 they've put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, a lot of training and a lot of uh, a lot of resources behind their their uh, their employees, and they want to make sure that they keep the good ones instead of um, you know they're being filtered off by other people. Um, and and realistically, amenities are one of those things that can help help people really build that connection with their people and their, and their organization. Um, so it, it actually can you know, really shape company culture. Like this is a, this is a golf simulator um, you know, event that uh, it was in one of our client spaces. And there's actually three or four different, uh, different lanes of this. You only see one of them in this picture. But the idea, idea for people to actually have a meeting and, and talk, you know, like you would actually on a real golf course, but you're actually doing it in work clothes and you don't have to actually, you know, drive way out into the, into the country to do this. Um, it's a great way to do that, uh, kind of get people, you know, in, involved in each other and understand what, what each other's issues are. Uh, you know, fitness center, wellness, uh, you know, uh, improving healthy behaviors is, a, is an enormous uh, amount of our, um, you know, direction for amenities right now. Um, and really what it's been is like, you know, 80s to 2010, not much. People had, had um, you know, desktop computers. Uh, if there was a, a fitness center in the building, it wasn't connected to your office and it wasn't always easy to go and use. Um, but, you know, from 2011 on, competing for talent became a real thing when, when uh, you know, the rise of Silicon Valley, you know, companies and, and Googles and, uh, you know, Facebook and all, all those, all those kind of giants in the um, amenity world really started putting things out there. It opened up everybody's eyes to what uh, things really could be and how good it really could be. Um, and then what we're really kind of looking at now is what is the true uh, reimagined office or workplace? <clears throat> Excuse me. And the spectrum of amenities like this, you know, might be something as simple as the coffee bar with uh, with you know advanced uh, uh, coffee into an actual barista service. Um, you know, the outdoor areas has become an enormous piece of what we're looking at right now. And I think what we just described with the uh, Armstrong uh, example uh, really has put that in uh, face forward in the idea that we we talk them into the idea a little bit. Now they love it. Now, when we go into building 701, the outdoor workplace is going to be a major part of that uh, of that building's renovation. Um, you know, fitness centers are kind of you know par for the course right now. It's sort of a basic. Um, if your building doesn't have them, then you're you're probably going to build one or have something you know very close by as as an amenity as a subsidized amenity to. Um, <laughs> what we're seeing also, Aaron, um, we started seeing these individual kind of fitness spaces. Some people were saying they didn't want to be in a group setting with their, you right. know, their coworkers. So even just thinking a little differently about what those fitness centers can be, um, mm -hmm. you know, it can be a smaller space with a Peloton or a mat and some mirrors, you know, right. for individual with a shower. So we're, we're rethinking some of those spaces that feel like more of like a, you know, almost like a hospitality offering right. than just right. sort you, of a... You, yeah. Right. Even the golf simulator is, is considered mm -hmm. a, a wellness and uh, fitness kind of application. Um, you know, getting into bigger ones though, child care and pet care. You know, bringing your bringing your pets to the office. That's that gets to be a little more a little more problematic and very expensive for for companies, but it's still it's still out there as as a concept. Um, and then you really get into ideas of, you know, you know, categorizing these things. So food and beverage, you know, there's baseline of things like a micro market is very simple to have somebody come in and set up and it's like an honor based system. And it's you know, tied to tied to your corporate card or a credit card, you know, all the way into having catering kitchens that people can come in and do you know, live food demonstrations or, you know, really have, you know, show a cooking class as part of your uh, part of your men, um, your kind of corporate culture amenity package. Um, you know, specialty coffee and water is, is, you know, is becoming very, very common now. I think we've done many projects with all kinds of different, uh, you know, coffee machines and or sparkling water machines with flavors. And even like that, um, that, you know, we've done a couple projects with a big Coca-Cola machine where you can kind of select your exact mix of beverage that you'd like. It's like a thousand different offerings in that like one right. machine. Yeah. 
um, you know, meeting and learning, video conferencing is the, is the basic, but then you get into co-working spaces and pinup spaces and all kinds of other, you know, multi-purpose rooms, even to the point of doing, I'm doing a couple of projects now with large auditoriums. Health and wellness, um, similar to the kind of fitness idea, but going beyond that to, you know, having mother's rooms in, in uh, multiple applications and having a place to, you know, for mothers to store that milk and be able to, um, you know, use that, use that room and, you know, get themselves ready afterward in a, in a very kind of, you know, serene setting. Uh, you know, game rooms and medical suites, uh, we're, we're doing a project, we have one with, uh, uh, one, one of our larger projects in Philadelphia with Comcast that actually has a medical suite, kind of actually multiple medical suites kind of built into their, um, into the facility. So you never need to leave the campus. It's like, never. it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, so convenience uh, and uh, is, you know, the idea that the IT genius bar, this is something that has started, I think out of probably out of the Apple store many years ago, but now it's, it's becoming pretty popular with the idea that, you, know, you don't need to set up a work ticket and have somebody come and do, you can actually take your laptop, whatever it is, take it down to a place, they can fix it right there, give you a new one, whatever it is, you know, a new piece of equipment, my mouse died, here's a ticket and go get a new one. And you grab a coffee while you're doing it. Exactly, and, and these things are really co-located so you can have, it's much more of a social space than it is just a pure working kind of space. Uh, transit, you know, on-site parking is, is kind of a lot of basic things, but then the ability to have, you know, electric vehicle charging stations or uh, for your car, for your bike, or for your scooter uh, is, is kind of a kind of a thing. Uh, you know, bike storage itself, having that indoors and, and knowing that people aren't going to be, you know, messing with your bike or stealing parts off that is, a, is, a, is kind of a big, uh, big element for a lot of people. Um, people are really kind of choosing buildings based on the idea that they have shared bike lanes and things like that to go along with it. Uh, we're almost done here. And oh, there we are. We are done. We are a couple minutes beyond our, our time slot. So I think that this point was uh, Melissa is going to come back on and find out if there's been any questions. Yes, perfect. Thank you both so much for sharing those insights and examples. That was fantastic. Students, we're going to turn over to audience Q&A, so definitely send your questions in. Again, that Q&A button can be found at the top or bottom of your screen. We've had several great questions come in already. First one I want to ask is, working, working remotely has been a game changer for neurodiverse people or people with disabilities. Do you see the new workplace doing a better job of accommodating and serving these individuals? Yes, early on, I was talking about inclusivity um, and, and the ability for the new workplace, or as we return to the office, to really uh, boost the mode that people with, with disabilities, with um, kind of alternate uh, modes of, of thought and working can really uh, contribute to the workplace. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, for a lot of people working remotely, especially kind of the, um, the more uh, introverted people have actually benefited from being able to be remote. They've been able to you know, add questions to the meetings without having um, to kind of face people you know, you know, one-to-one. The thing is emboldened people to, uh, who normally wouldn't have to be able to you know, submit a, 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 either a chat request or, or without their camera being on, be able to really kind of you know, you know, jump into meetings and, and talk. Or um, or react uh, in a way that may not have done it in the office. So that is really part of how we're understanding how people come back to the office. We understand that people are not all going to come back in. People that are much better off being at home, being in a remote location, um, should continue to do that. And actually, as Gensler goes back, we are doing it on a volunt voluntary basis only. The other thing, just to add on to Aaron's answer is something that we've been talking about for a long time is the idea of choice and balance and not everyone works the same. Works, work styles are so different, not only from you know, departments, but from individual. So providing lots of different spaces that ac can accommodate different work styles, I think is really important. Um, but we're still learning about that as well. Um, you know, I'm hearing project teams are, are getting, um, 
even training on just things to be more aware of that, that maybe that we weren't aware of in the past. So I think it's something that we're all learning and, and adapting and, and uh, just more conversations are having are being had, which is really great. Absolutely. One student has written in, thank you for the presentation and sharing the insights that you've gained from this worldwide pandemic. I noticed on an earlier slide pertaining to the previous research that you found unassigned seating had proved to be less productive. Does the AWI pilot program include permanent workspaces or do you feel that the flexible workspace will become a more productive way of life as long as there are additional amenities? That's a hot topic, right, Erin? It's something that we talk about a lot. And, um, and they've talked about a lot, yes. Right. And it's it's very complex. Um, something that, you know, we've always looked at like the one to one, the head, you know, one seat to per person kind of idea. And that if you are in the office less than three days a week, then, you know, you have more flexibility, but there it, it comes at a trade off. If you're only in the office two days a week, it's really hard to justify having a dedicated space only for two days. So what can that look like? Um, again, it's gonna look different for everybody, for every client per se. And it's something that um, is gonna take a lot of conversations and really kind of understanding um, how you can accommodate um, those different requests. So um, it, it's something that, you know, is gonna look different for every client. Yeah, because we, we have clients that actually have people that have desks in you know, permanent desks in multiple locations. And they're just trying to get them down to one desk in one location. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum of what that really is. Um, but I think that as far as Armstrong's example goes, you know, they, they have been in their current spaces for, you know, many people 20 some years. And it's very difficult for, uh, you know, for them to kind of see the future. And, you know, we've, we've been working with them, you know, to do the pilot and to do change management and understand how we can help them understand what a different type of workstation can look like. Right now, they're all they're all living in things that are very 90s based. So you know, eight foot by 10 foot stations with you know 66 inch panels all the way around. Getting I think also what it looks oh, like sorry. in the future is different. Go ahead. So I think we kind of touched upon this earlier. We we have started talking about work points. So work happening at the desk, whether it's in an open environment or an enclosed environment, a private office, but also can happen in other places. Because that's a big concern about, um, you know, the hybrid environment for a client is that, well, what if everyone comes on the same day, then what? Um, and then we have these zones that we're testing, uh, touchdown zones. Um, you know, maybe I come into the office a few times a year and I want a touchdown zone, but I want it to be connected to a hub space where I'm gonna see people and I'm gonna be connected. Or maybe I'm the type of person that, you know, I'm in the office two days a week and I wanna be in more of like a quiet car, like a, a slightly quieter space. So even having touchdown spaces that lo look different and are in different places in the space allows people again, you know, you take that idea of touchdown, but you kind of reimagine that to look <laughs> um, three different versions of that. <laughs> That's great, thank you. What are the key metrics you will use to measure the success of the lab pilot? That's a Just big one. A meeting about this one. I know, <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> that, well, okay, so one, one of the pieces actually was about, um, uh, about clean air. And, and they're actually collecting data off of their, their sensors in the space itself to understand what the, what, and those are actually kind of uh, mechanical uh, and uh, you know, air delivery metrics that they're kind of being calculated through whatever computer they've got, you know, running that. So that, that's one line of it. The other one is, is that we've actually done a lot of the surveying of the space and you know, leaving little post-it notes around the space for people to you know, write what they like about something, and that's it's a very, it's a very key place or a key way of understanding what the what the data coming back to us really is. Um, with that, you know, we we have uh, four different manufacturers of workstations in there. We're we're able to kind of hone in on which are the which of the manufacturers and which of the desks of the manufacturers are more popular, and for what reason. So. 
there, there's a lot of ways to get those metrics, whether or not they're, you know, they're coming in as uh, as actual like computer data or or soft data is really yeah some of that needs to be synthesized <laughs> yes. um, and kind of distilled um, right because you, you kind of have to unpack some of that but some is like you, uh, acoustics is a big piece of that um, how how easily is it to reconfigure or you know is the technology intuitive um, mm -hmm. you know easy ways to connect and learn and so we're we're kind of fielding all of these questions and, and data that will, you know, like Aaron said, it's sort of like, you know, high data and then low, you know, so it's a balance between the two. And, and acoustics is, is interesting because it's very different for different people. I like having a noise. I like having a little little something in the background. When I'm, when I'm working alone in the house, I have the radio on just because I don't like the quiet. Mm -hmm. Some people can't do anything unless it's pin drop quiet. So, it's it's a, that's a very it's a very difficult one to actually kind of monitor and, and help our clients with because it's it's such a different range of expectations. Absolutely, these designs are beautiful and inspiring. How can some of the lear these learnings and designs for big companies be applied in smaller workspaces with fewer resources? I think it's sort of the same thing. It's sort of the same approach when we look at a large scale project or a small scale project, maybe it doesn't have so many facets to it, but it's still, we go through a very similar process, mm -hmm. right, Aaron? I mean, I oh, think- yeah. No, the actually the, the pilot is a great example. The yeah. pilot is Scalable. not even 10,000 square feet, but it represents what can happen in, um, what is it, 88,000 square feet, which is building 701. Um, and, it's, and it's really, you know, it, you're going to get less people, sure, but at the same time, all the elements are there to understand what, what work is for the people that, that are coming in. Um, so it really is scalable. You really can um, understand how, um, how your different elements are coming together. And, and every office has focus space. Every office has uh, collaboration space. Every office has learning space as well as socialization space. How much of it? of each one of those things is really up to the organization and of the, you know, the size of the organization, the, the kind of will of the organization is, um, is another part, so. Mm -hmm. Right. We have one student that's written in, thank you for a wonderful presentation. One of the requirements for a LEED certification is a smaller footprint of a building. How does that affect the post-pandemic workspace where people are looking to have more space and be distanced uh, under the same roof. I think it's more about the hybrid environment, mm -hmm. you know, really taking a hard look at how much real estate is actually needed. It may not, not be, um, you know, what it was in the past and where if you're already dealing with an existing building like AWI, we're focused on a building that's already built and, you know, the boundaries are already there. Um, you're sort of saying, are you know, how much space are we dedicating to a work zone a true of the true sense versus amenity space? You know, there's trade-offs. You do not need a 200 square foot office. You know, in some cases you don't need a 120 square foot, you know, private office. So trying to really think about those spaces through a hard lens to say, okay, how can we shift and, and gain more through that shift of square footage allotment um, towards more of amenity and collaboration zones. Right. Well, we are just about out of time. Students, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, but I do have one final question. I'd love to hear from each of you. Any final words of advice or wisdom for the students tuning in today? I think it's, it's it really the message is about optimism and just you know the excitement for the future. We've just come out of a really tough year and um, you know, wherever you are in sort of your educational journey, just know that, um, you know, the future is bright and this is a really exciting time to be in design. And, and um, you know, if you're the type of person that sort of thrives in a team environment, like, you know, just challenge each other and be open to ideas and um, be open to other people's ideas. So that's sort of my, my big advice. Yeah, I mean, the, it's the, the office is not dead. And you know, alternate workplace other than your your living room or, or whatever is not the 
you know, is not going to be the future. So, you know, it, what, whatever it was is really different than what it will be in the future. But at the same time, it, there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, great advice. Students, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to learn more about Gensler, you can visit gensler.com. If you'd like to learn more about the original Americas, you can visit theoriginalamericas.com. Linda, Aaron, a huge thank you. This has been a fantastic presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you for great. having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for everything. Bye, students.